Okay, welcome everybody to Rethinking Patron and Staff Permission Groups in NC Cardinal. Um, I am the, the host of this session. Uh, my name is Amy Terlaga. I'm from Bibliomation. We're a con Connecticut consortium, for those of you who don't know, Bibliomation. We're sponsoring this Zoom session. Closed captioning is being sponsored by Equinox Open Library Initiative, and we'd like to thank our captioner today. Um, this is in meeting mode, not webinar mode, so please leave your video off and your uh, mic off and uh, use chat when asking a question um, or commenting. I'm very pleased to introduce Benjamin Murphy and April Durrance from NC Cardinal, and I will turn this over to them. All right, thank you. Um, so, as Amy said, the topic for our presentation is Rethinking Patron and Staff Permission Groups in NC Cardinal. A little about who we are. April Durrance is our NC Cardinal Training Specialist, and she's going to talk to you about our Staff Permissions Project. My name is Benjamin Murphy, and I'm the NC Cardinal Program Manager, and I'm going to be talking to you about our Patron Permissions Project. So, a bit of background. NC Cardinal is a statewide consortium of public libraries using a shared instance of Evergreen. We began in 2011 and are now serving about half the public library systems in North Carolina. We had an average of about four new library systems each year. In the early years, we were focused on bringing in new libraries and reaching a critical mass. As we grew, so did our number and variety of patron types, shelving locations, circ mods, etc. When we started resource sharing in 2013, it emphasized the importance of implementing standards and consistency between libraries. We started off with consolidation projects to clean up things like our CERC mods and shelving locations. And last year we took on patron and staff permissions. So I'm gonna tell you about our process for cleaning up patron permissions and April will talk about our project to address staff permissions. So when we started with patron permission project, we had some permission groups like limited juvenile, limited, limited juvenile, one year juvenile, new user, limited juvenile, new user, limited teen juve, teen juve, limited YA, limited YA, new user, young adult, new user, young adult, teen, school, and about six other different types of children's accounts. We also had some super specific permission groups like general. So when creating a new user, these groups were not displayed in a logical order as shown in the screenshot here. Individual library systems had different policies about which groups they used and didn't have CERC policies written for all those various groups. So if a staff member assigned a permission group for which that library system didn't have a CERC policy defined, they might see unexpected behavior as the transaction hit a more generic CERC policy. The same thing might happen if a user visited a nearby library system that didn't use the same permission groups. So for instance, if your library is using Teen Limited and a limited YA user from a neighboring county visits your library, they might not have the limited behavior that you expect. So a little bit about our process. The first thing we wanted to do was understand which permission groups were being used for circulation or hold policies and how many users were in those groups. Then we wanted to understand the functionality that our library systems were trying to accommodate. Then we wanted to report back to each library what everyone else in the consortium was doing then we wanted to propose a new set of simplified permission groups, let library systems know how their current policies could work with those new permission groups, and address all the different outlying use cases we came across. Finally, we wanted to reach a consensus on the permission groups we'd been using, we would be using, and implement the changes. So one of the complications with consolidating permission groups is that you have to account for the various circulation and hold policies that refer to the various permission groups. So one of our first steps was to look at the number of users in each group and then see which systems had rules that referenced those permission groups. This chart shows which systems had circulation or hold rules referencing a specific permission group and how many users for that system were in those permission groups. CERC or hold policies that reference the more generic user or patron permission groups wouldn't be impacted by the changes we were making to the more specific permission groups. In this image, each of the colored cells in this chart had a corresponding circulation or hold rule that had to be altered if we changed the permission group it references. Uncolored cells with a number in it were covered by the more generic rule. 
One of the things you'll also notice is instances where there were only one or two users assigned to a permission group for a system that had no rules defined. Generally, this group, this due was due to the confusion caused by the chaotic drop-down list, leading to staff assigning a permission group that is outside of their system's policy. So once we had a sense of where things were, we created a survey for member libraries that focused on the functionality of the various permission groups. There was, these were some of the questions that we asked. Rather than focusing on what groups were presently in use, we wanted to know how do libraries need those groups to function? How are limited accounts different than normal accounts? How do juvenile or teen accounts function differently than adult accounts? Once we had survey responses from our users, we created customized reports for each library system showing their responses compared to the responses of the rest of the consortium libraries. This helped them to understand how their responses fit in with the rest of their peers. As we worked through the survey responses, we started to hone a list of simplified permission groups and communicate with individual library systems to understand the outlying scenarios and how we might be able to accommodate those needs. This is an example of the feedback we gave to systems with the survey responses showing what the proposed changes were for the permission groups and how the functionality they needed could be provided by the new permission groups. Also, we included what questions we wanted to hold votes on at our annual meeting discussion. You can see those on the right-hand side, for instance. So in these reports, we included information about all of the circulation and hold policies that each library had that, different, that didn't reference user or patron. We indicated which policies referred to permission groups that we were proposing changes for and how we proposed that rule could be adapted. In this example, you can see the permission group in the first column that was being changed, and the second to last column shows the permission group those users were to be moved to. This often took a bit of back and forth to understand the needs of the system and what a reasonable adaptation would be. All of these reports were generated using mail merge and sent as PDF attachments. So once we had all the reports together, we sent them out a month ahead of our annual meeting so that people had time to digest them. At our annual meeting, we talked through the proposed changes, gave people a chance to discuss the changes, and then voted on the proposals. This gave us our marching orders to implement the changes. So there were a few things of interest that we encountered when implementing the changes. Prior to these changes, we had not yet made much use of Evergreen's ability to define circulation rules according to a user's age. For instance, where we had no fines for seniors, we set up new adult rules for eight users that were age 18 to 59 with normal fine policies, and then an additional set of adult rules for, with no fines for users age 60 to 105. In general, this seemed to work pretty well. For some policies, we implemented patron stat cats that hadn't been used before to allow systems to track group circulations where unique circulation rules weren't needed. Examples of this included groups like military and college. For generic accounts like general, we migrated users to more specific categories according to their date of birth. So outcomes, we went from 35 permission groups down to 12. On the left, you can see the list of permission groups that we ended up with. Once all the decisions were made, the new permission groups were added or edited. Then the circulation and hold rules were updated. And then we asked Mobius to update the 1 million plus accounts with the new permission groups that they had been assigned. This update query took about seven minutes and 30 seconds and affected about half of our users. We ended up with a simpler list of permission groups and clearer and more consistent policies. Uh, I want to say special thanks to the team at Mobius for helping us to implement this and for Johnny Pippen from the Cardinal team who did most of the work to find solutions with our clients for these changes. And with that, I'll turn it over to April Durantz. All right, and I am going to share my screen. All right. So um, for staff permissions, the thinking process uh, began back in 2014, 2015 as part of a larger project to expand our cataloging best practices and address what were perceived as problems within the consortium catalog 
such as duplicate, sometimes brief bibliographic records imported when libraries migrated into the consortium, the variability of cataloging styles and standards across the consortium, sort of like, uh, you know, what everyone was talking about in the last session, and good bibs overwritten by poor quality vendor records during batch imports, etc. One of the elements of the project would be to require staff to pass some sort of assessment in order to be certified to catalog in the NC Cardinal Consortium. This was a big change that generated a good deal of discussion and some measure of trepidation among staff and directors alike. But the membership agreed that we should undertake the project at our annual meeting in the summer of 2015. It was a long process to expand best practices, develop training and assessment questions in 2016 and 2017, then present in-person training sessions in the spring and fall of 2018. We tried to communicate frequently and clearly throughout the process to help alleviate concerns. The final part of the overall cataloging training and assessment project was to make changes to ensure that only those who had passed assessments were granted cataloging permission. When we started, cataloging and other permissions were spread widely and repeatedly across many different permission groups. Tackling this part of the project also gave us a chance to evaluate our overall allocation of permissions and the structure of staff permission groups. We had noted over the years that there were problem areas, such as staff sometimes assigning staff permission groups to patron accounts in error. We also found that any staff member could create a new account and assign it to Global Admin, the most powerful permission group that should only be used by the NC Cardinal team. So not ideal. And over the years, some permissions have been granted to various staff accounts on an individual ad hoc basis, which made it difficult to track who could actually do what since the permission group assigned didn't tell the whole story. So this was an opportunity to, to address these issues and improve our database security all at once. Starting at the beginning of the larger cataloging project, we really had to conceptualize what the staff permissions revamp would look like. How could we better utilize the permission features in Evergreen? What did we need to look out for? How could we control who could create staff accounts and therefore access to patron data? So I started with research. I searched high and low for any documentation, IRC discussion, or whatever I could find that referenced permissions. Looking through the FOSS manual, older documentation that listed all of the permissions with brief descriptions, and the presentation that Shay Tedderton from Equinox did for the 2012 Evergreen Conference in Indiana. We were trying to follow an agile methodology to create, test, and roll out key features incrementally across two of our three test databases. I started experimenting in what we call the NEXT database, which we mostly use for upgrades and projects. Library staff don't normally utilize it unless we're in the midst of an upgrade. So I was free to totally restructure permission groups, reallocate permissions, and try to break things. Another critical element that we really needed for this project to work was to be able to lock down access to certain permission groups. So within the next database, I was able to play and figure out how to do that. Once we were ready to expand testing to include all library staff, we rolled the changes onto our dev database, which is the test database that most staff are used to using, both during their migration into NC Cardinal and when they want a safe place to do some general testing. One of the key components for the larger cataloging training and assessment project was to alleviate staff concerns about being evaluated or judged. We needed to continually communicate and build buy-in for staff and directors. So we tried to thoroughly discuss the benefits of the changes and the way it would help address frustrations with the catalog. So once we did that research and testing, we had to really explain and sell this to library staff because again, there was a lot of trepidation and concern around the cataloging assessment process. And, you know, obviously changing how staff can access the staff client and serve their patrons is a big deal. So this was something we really had to present and discuss over and over again. 
the changes we were making would really take advantage of the inheritance structure that Evergreen has that we weren't utilizing at the time. So as you can see in our legacy structure, there were header permission groups that were sort of extraneous and didn't perform any real function. And we didn't have much in the way of inheritance. So there was a tremendous amount of improvement that we could make. So this was the restructure that we were going for. On the right, you can see descriptions of some of the functions that staff can perform at each permission group level. The new circulation hierarchy means that CERF lead inherits all the circulator permissions plus has additional permissions. Branch admin inherits all the CERF lead permissions plus additional permissions. System admin inherits all of these permissions. So it's the most powerful in the circulation hierarchy and only assigned to directors and system login access managers. We did change the name of branch admin from the original local system administrator because we thought having system in the name of two permission groups might cause confusion. We wanted to clearly indicate which was the more elevated permission group. This is our cataloging hierarchy, which had to break off from circulator so that catalogers could still perform all those basic circulation functions, but all cataloging permissions were isolated to these two permission groups. We did eliminate the acquisitions permission groups because there is significant functional overlap and we wanted the permission group to be based on the job of the staff member, not on the Evergreen module. This allows libraries the maximum flexibility to use any part of acquisitions that is useful to them without any change to permission group assignments. One of the important features that we needed to implement were policy-based changes. It's important for an organization to let members know how changes will apply to them and that any consequences will be applied equitably. The governance board first passed the staff login accounts and permissions policy, which established the system login access managers, one or more staff members designated by the director at each library system who are responsible for creating new staff accounts when staff are hired or change positions, as well as inactivating accounts when staff leave the library. The policy also established which permission groups can be assigned to generic accounts and which can only be applied to indiv individually assigned accounts, such as administrative and cataloging permission groups. Once we were further along in the cataloging training and assessment project, Benjamin and I worked with the cataloging committee on the final draft to present to the governance committee to help define a cataloging policy. In fact, I reviewed several cataloging policies created by other Evergreen consortia to develop a first draft. This was another crucial step for the full implementation because we needed to make sure everyone knew what the new cataloging permissions, permission groups could and couldn't do what temporary assignment to a cataloging permission group would entail in terms of the deadline to pass the necessary assessments and what the consequences would be if a library system didn't have catalogers who passed assessments within the time allotted. There are links here in the slide and you're welcome to take a look at these policies in our NC Cardinal knowledge books. When it came down to the nitty gritty of reallocating permissions, we did, did run into a few challenges. The mysterious everything permission group was assigned to system admin and local system branch admin prior to our project. Because we couldn't determine which permissions were included with everything and whether cataloging permissions were included, we decided to limit that permission to the global admin permission group. We found the brief or sometimes similar descriptions for some permissions challenging. So the difference between copy needed for hold dot override and renew hold override are not entirely clear. We also found some permissions that were not assigned to anyone, most likely because they were part of the everything set of permissions, but we wanted to assign them to at least the global admin account just in case. One of the key features that I've mentioned is our intention to lock down which permission group can be assigned to which accounts. Finding the mechanism to restrict cataloging permissions to staff who had passed assessments was crucial to the success of the overall project. 
utilizing Evergreen's group application permissions within the editing permission field in the group configuration tab allowed us to do exactly what we needed to. There are multiple options for applying a specific group application permission to the group configuration editing permission field, which you can see highlighted in yellow here. Assigning that specific group application permission to a particular permission group means only staff assigned to that assigned that group application permission can edit the associated permission group or assign it to a user account. This might sound a little confusing, but if you look at the slide, you can see that the editing permission for the item cataloging permission group is group underscore application dot user dot staff dot admin dot global underscore admin. When a when we applied that group application permission to the editing permission for system admin, item cat, and bibcat, it meant that only global admins, which would be the NC Cardinal team, could assign those permission groups. So global admins see the full list of Evergreen staff permission groups in the patron registration screen and are the only users who can assign any and all of these permission groups, meaning the uh, system admin, item cat, and bibcat. If we look at the branch admin example on this screen, the editing permission applied is group underscore application dot user dot staff, which is then assigned to the system admin permission group. That means that system admins are the only ones who can assign any account with that editing permission. So system admins only see and can assign volunteer, circulator, circ lead, and branch admin in the patron registration screen. And that means for staff accounts, they can assign patron accounts as well. Other staff permission groups can only assign patron permission groups because they were only assigned the group underscore applications dot user dot patron permission, which is applied as the editing permission for all patron accounts. So most staff, other than system admins, no longer see any staff permission groups. Only patron permission groups are in the list they see in the patron registration screen. So not only could we lock down the cataloging permission groups, we could also ensure that only directors and their designated SLAMs could be assigned to the system admin permission group. And that was the only permission group which could in turn create any staff accounts at all. Other staff could no longer assign themselves to higher permission groups or accidentally assign staff permission groups to patrons, creating a more secure patron database. So we had to figure out the steps we needed to take to get us to the final implementation implementation stage. We, how could we transform transition, sorry, without staff downtime. We didn't want to have to go offline for this process, and yet we were completely rebuilding the way that a significant number of staff would access Evergreen. We also wanted to rename and restructure existing staff permission groups to preserve any coded behavior that might exist behind the scenes in Evergreen. We also wanted to communicate frequently and clearly with the entire consortium to make sure that everyone understood the intentions and actions that we would be taking and also find a gentle way to encourage and track staff compliance with some of the necessary interim steps, such as creating system login access managers for each system. Those SLAMs needed to set up individual staff accounts for staff who were going to be performing administrative and cataloging functions before we could reassign permission groups. So we sent regular updates and reminders and provided multiple mechanisms for questions and feedback from the directors SLAMs and frontline staff. When we were ready to broaden testing, we were able to try out the implementation process by rolling everything from the next database to the dev database. With the project wrap up scheduled for early August of 2019, we had several meetings with SLAMs in June and July. Once we were deep into testing in the dev database, we wanted the system login access managers to be the conduit for staff feedback. Any problems, questions, or challenges, since they are, they are known to the staff who work in their library system. That also meant they were heavily invested in getting things right because they were going to hear about it if something didn't work in the production database. So they were testing and encouraging staff to test. 
This was another element critical to the, to the success of the project. In early August, we presented an update to directors at our annual meeting, made several announcements on our listservs, and thanks to Benjamin's expertise with mail merge, we were even able to send an email to each individual staff member to let them know what permissions would be assigned to their individual login access account. We wanted to be sure that staff were fully informed. We also needed to be sure that we communicated with Mobius to get all our steps coordinated. So on August 5th, after, after libraries closed, I finalized the permission restructure and locked down all staff accounts so nobody could make any changes to staff accounts on April 6th, which was a regular workday for staff. During that day, Benjamin ran scripts and we checked through all staff accounts to populate and sort a brand new spreadsheet, making sure we had the correct assignments for all existing staff accounts. The evening of August 6th, after libraries closed, Mobius copied the permissions list from dev to production for Evergreen staff permission groups and reallocated permission groups to staff accounts. For reallocating permission groups to staff accounts, there was a certain order that we wanted to follow. First, any individual permissions that may have been assigned to staff accounts or granted years ago by other users had to be stripped out. We were no longer allowing ad hoc permissions. Any secondary permission groups also had to be stripped out. So then all the primary permission group assignments were based on whether staff had cataloging permissions or not. If they did, the primary account would be the cataloging permission group. While they inherited circulator permissions, some catalogers might need higher level permissions, uh, circulation permissions like circ lead or branch admin. So that could be assigned as a secondary permission group. And some of the uh, catalogers were also the system admins or the SLAMs. So based on this structure, catalogers were the only staff who might need both a primary and secondary permission group. All other staff only needed a primary circulation permission group assigned. As you can see, this is just a little snippet of the very long and detailed spreadsheet we used. It lists everyone by name with their account ID, which primary and secondary permission groups they had been assigned to before the change, and then which ones they should have af afterwards, all color coded. So this was our final set of staff permission groups with a clean inheritance structure that resolved all of the issues that we wanted to address. In a mechanical sense, we were able to transition away from this repetitive representation of permissions. For instance, the title holds permission was assigned five times to different permission groups. The green boxes here represent permissions assigned at the consortium level, yellow is system, and purple is branch level. So we went from this to this, our final permission allocation, which is much cleaner and easier to see who has what permission. Utilizing inheritance structure meant that most permissions only had to be assigned once and then inherited by other permission groups that needed it. You're welcome to click on the link to see the full spreadsheet. After the new structure and permissions had been added to production, there were a flurry of questions and I spent a couple of full days troubleshooting via phone calls, emails, and in Basecamp with the system login access managers, checking to see whether a permission or permission group wasn't assigned correctly, although we had very little of that crop up. We didn't end up making some adjustments to a few permissions up or down the hierarchy based on consensus of slams. There were a few hiccups with acquisitions permissions, so we had to sort out at what level consortium or system several permissions should be assigned. For example, the view provider permission. Mostly there were minor gaps in communication or understanding of the changes. While most changes were working as agreed and planned, some staff had not known about or realized all of the ramific ramifications of some of those changes. So there were a few challenges with that. And then we found that there were a few bugs that interfere with some of our intentions. A big one we discovered is that a permission check is not performed before staff add a new item or volume. So even though a staff member was assigned to a permission group that did not have 
the create permissions to do so, they were able to create new volumes and item records. This bug is still outstanding, so please feel free to put some heat on it if that's something you think should be fixed. Here's also a link to other permission bugs that everyone may encounter. We assigned or reassigned 592 permissions and removed close to 500 duplicates. A total of 589 staff accounts had their permission groups edited. The improved transparency of permission assignments has allowed libraries to decide how to assign Circulator and CircLead to their staff. Larger libraries tend to use Circulator for most frontline staff and only designate certain staff to have CircLead, while smaller libraries tend to have all frontline staff use CircLead because those staff generally cover a wider set of duties without as much backup or overlap. These are some of the things we are doing or working on as a consortium. Our newest NC Cardinal team member, Llewellyn Marshall, is currently working on a means to automatically flag bi bibliographic records and items that need review and notify the appropriate catalogers. Um, we base this actually on some uh, work that uh, Blake at Mobius had done, and so we really appreciate those efforts. Um, I'm particularly excited to see this come to fruition as all of these cataloging improvements should increase the success of ongoing deduplications and the quality of results that patrons get when performing cataloging searches. Um, for the Evergreen community, we hope to help improve documentation of permissions by expanding descriptions of individual permissions based on what we know now and discover in the future. And we would love to see a community code audit of permissions at some point in the future to know more about how each permission operates in the code and make sure that appropriate permission is needed and expected. And um, just as a wrap up, I want to say um, thank you to all the uh, system login access managers, directors, and staff at uh, NC Cardinal who did work on this project. And a big thanks to uh, Blake at Mobius for helping uh, you know, get all of this in place and helping to answer questions. I had many questions and uh, you know, help us work through all this. And of course, uh, you know, Benjamin and uh, the cataloging committee and the governance board. So um, we, this was a, a huge effort um, with a lot of people uh, chiming in and helping and, and uh, making all the parts work. So any questions? We're happy to answer any questions that you guys have. We did have the one question about the system login access manager and sort of what that was. Um, yeah, are there thoughts or questions? Book clubs. So, uh, G. Monty, what do you recommend libraries do for book clubs? We were considering making a new permission group for that. Um, I'm not sure what the scenario on that would be. Um, April, any any thoughts on that? Um, well, we do have, um, we did grant the ability um, to place multiple holds. So, um, I'm not sure what the what the use case would be for a for a specific permission group. Do you have more on that? G Monty? <laughs> um, Lindsay, uh, the the testing for specific permissions. Um, I mean, it was it was just if if we knew or thought we knew what the permission did, we would try to um, to break it or do you know something uh, that you shouldn't be able to do with that permission or um, just you know it, so it was it was more when we opened it up to everyone, it was more just asking everyone to do their normal job and see if anything. Um, anything didn't didn't work as expected. 
I, uh, I just asked that because I'm in the process of doing that now, or at least I had been in the process of doing it now before, you know, March. But um, I was really kind of frustrated with all of those things where the definition was just a reiteration of the code name. Yes. <laughs> so I at one point started by just turning them off. And it's like, can I do the thing I think I can do with this? And uh, so I've got kind of my running log of, you know, my definitions for what I, you know, kind of assume these things did. So I was just wondering if anybody else was doing anything kind of similar. Um, one thing that I'll mention with that is that when we were going through our initial testing with our system login access managers, we were we would ask them if it doesn't you know if you're trying to do something that you're usually doing mm -hmm. and it doesn't work give us that information on the screen yeah. about what it says because that kind of could help you reverse engineer some of that yeah i mean i literally started with okay i can log into the staff client and <laughs> now what and then just added them back in one at a time which is effective but slow so <laughs> At any rate, no, this was a really super informative uh, and helpful uh, presentation, so thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I saw, Diane, your question. Um, translated into English, I mean, unfortunately, what's there is, is what currently exists. So, you know, this is something I hope to be able to work on to, you know, as, as we have um, run into issues with uh, any permission or um, just trying to expand uh, on that spreadsheet that is linked in our slides. I'm just trying to expand the explanation of what it does. And, um, you know, so yeah, great, Lindsay, maybe we can uh, collaborate there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, add to add to that list so that we can make it a little more uh, user friendly. <laughs> yes, it does, Andrea. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah. it would be helpful for a lot of, you know, a lot of folks who are attacking this. Well, and trying to figure out, you know, go from a problem to a solution, you know, knowing, okay, I'm having this issue with the way that Evergreen is behaving and tracking it back through that entire list. Is it the ability to create? Is it the ability to edit? Is it, you know, of an individual sort of thing? Um, that's, you know, it's hard to figure out. Yes, Andrea, I, I mean, I could never find a list of all the permissions that are actually in everything. So if you know of one, um, I know, you know, that it at some point, it included everything up to maybe, maybe version 2.1, um, you know, every permission that existed up to that point, but I don't really know what those were. <laughs> um, you know, I guess it might be the one, just the ones that are in the documentation, but yeah, that's a mystery. Irene, uh, your point about having more granular permissions, there's a certain set of permissions about being able to edit sort of tiers of permission group um, privileges. It's group.application. something. something. You know, and there's only, I think, seven or so of those in the system. And those, you know, you assign those to a permission group, and that means that every that permission group can then um, make adjustments to certain types of permission groups um, lower in the hierarchy. And so that kind of, um, it's not a very um, detailed uh, permission structure there. Seeing Andrea's uh, mention about the kinds of things that everything covers. Oh, I'd be interested to see that. <clears throat> Other thoughts or questions? What kind of things have you all encountered um, when you're approaching um, trying to consider alterations to staff permissions or even users? Um, other questions or or uh, challenges that you've faced when dealing with that sort of thing? How many of you have attempted to take on a project is anything like this or um, 
you know, try to, to alter some of your permissions. <laughs> Amen to that, C. Burton. <laughs> yeah, it took us a while to get rolling. It, um, you know, we kind of knew what we wanted to do, but, you know, at one stage, April was going through and, you know, permission by permission, what do we want to do? What level does this want to be assigned at? Or do we want to assign this at, given our inheritance structure? Um, you know, so it, it's, and we didn't always get it right. And sometimes, you know, that's frustrating for people when they say, well, all of a sudden I can't do this thing in acquisitions. And, you know, you have to sort of figure out, oh, okay, that's because this needs to be at this level and uh, some of that kind of stuff. Diane, if we can, um, if, if you need either uh, consolation on the troubles you're facing along the way, or if we can be of any help, um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Debbie. Yeah, I have to, I have to uh, um, really give April credit for being able to approach this in such a structured and, and deliberate way, you know, um, not only figuring out what some of those group application permissions do, and, you know, we really didn't have any knowledge of that prior, um, but then being able to go into the inheritance structure and figuring out, does that actually behave according to how um, we think this should behave? Um, and then once we had sort of our, our inheritance structure in place, you know, going through that list of 400 and some odd individual permissions, um, you know, it was, um, uh, it was a daunting task. But hopefully some of you, if you're interested in doing something like this, um, might be able to make use of some of that um, work there and, you know, be able to iterate off of that and learn some things. Um, Lindsay, we're on 3.4, uh, no, sorry, 3.4. Six, 3.4. Hmm? <laughs> I have to look it up now. Yes. Yeah, it's 3.3.4, I think is what we, it, I don't know if we did our little micro. Right, right. 3.3.4. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about 3.4, 3.5. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Lindsay is saying that adding a couple of new permissions when going from 3.2 to 3.4. Yes, we, we did have to deal with that when we upgraded. Um, and I forget what the particular one was, but there was one that actually had to do with logging in. And um, I think Blake ended up adding that on the database side. So. Do you think this structure should replace the stock structure out of the box? So April, having gone from um, approaching, well, I guess uh, our, our training database has the stock structure. Um, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think that? I think the hierarchy structure is, is very useful. Um, you know, I mean, it depends on how a library system or consortia might want their individual permissions to be allocated, but I think the stock structure does not take advantage of the inheritance um, in, in a way that I think is efficient. Um, so that part of it for sure, I, I think the, the permission assignments are a little more, you know, case sensitive, I guess. Use, use case, you know. And we weren't sure, I remember at an early stage of this, we weren't sure that the inheritance um, actually worked the way that we eventually tested and found that it did work. We didn't know that for sure if you assign something at one level and you have inheritance coming off of that, that it would actually properly um, work because we did, you know, there were some um, permission bugs as, as April mentioned. Um, so I think anytime you can simplify like that, it's good. We, one of the choices we made that I think April mentioned was 
we didn't do any um, ad hoc um, assignable permissions. We just sort of said, if it's in the permission group, you can get that permission group. But, um, you know, we're, we're not going to have a grantable, I think is the, the language. We're not going to have grantable permissions um, for, yeah. for any of this stuff. We're going to make our structure and put people in it. Yeah, that, I mean, just from a, a management, a database management standpoint, um, that made more sense um, not, not to have those uh, kind of ad hoc grantable permissions. And, you know, we were able to arrive at a structure where they're, they're not really needed, I don't think, or, you know, we haven't, that hasn't been an aspect that um, many libraries have, um, you know, had issues with or, or you know, taken issue with. So um, I think, I think it works pretty well this way, at least for us. Blake added a comment, this subject hasn't been addressed at the community level to his knowledge, and it could be that you arrived at a more 2020 friendly solution or structure. Well, thanks, Blake. I, I mean, yeah, if, if anybody, um, you know, wants to look at it, I'm happy to, um, you know, be a part of that team if, uh, if anybody wants to take it up. Any other thoughts or uh, comments? Let's see what we're doing on time here. Yeah, about a quarter till. Um, if not, we can go ahead and um, um, wrap up if uh, happy to uh, brainstorm or answer any, any other questions that uh, come up. April, what was your biggest surprise um, or what was the biggest thing maybe that you learned in going through this project? <laughs> I think um, at some point I was, uh, you know, just overwhelmed by all the things that could go wrong. <laughs> and so it was more just um, taking, taking the plunge and um, knowing that uh, with everybody invested in testing, we could, we could figure it out if, you know, if something didn't work. Um, because, I mean, you could spend years trying to, trying to figure every, every single permission out and exactly what it does, um, you know, from, from, an, from an end user perspective, um, you know, not, not having um, the insight of the developers who, who wrote the code, um, it, you know, it, it's just daunting. So, so I think just sort of saying, I think this is what this does. It hasn't broken when I test, you know, when I did my testing, let's throw it out there and, and see what other people discover. Um, you know, at some point you just had to take the plunge. And, and so we did that. So when Angla said, April, I can't remember what we discussed on this, but I remember there being questions about why we couldn't place holds using our staff logins. I'm still curious about the ability to place a recall hold for cataloging seems like that would be placed from the staff cataloging user account, but I can't remember the discussion on that. We, I think um, the, the idea behind not using the staff login accounts for holds and circulations was to um, keep, you know, keep that data um, for those accounts uh, cleaner and, um, you know, so I mean, there there might be a use case for that, but um, there are also um, we recommend using institution accounts for um, you know staff actions that need to you know that if you need to place a hold for story time or something like that. So you know, it's it's just a um, a choice. You know, there's not necessarily. Um, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it shouldn't absolutely shouldn't be done. Um, you know, it's not going to break the database or anything, but, um, you know, just as, uh, in order to keep things cleaner, to keep all the personal usage off of the staff login accounts, that's why we um, sort of drew the line there. I think another aspect of that is that, you know, in Evergreen, is this isn't the same in all ILS systems, creating a patron account is the same interface as creating a staff account, you know, creating a login account or an account in which you can interact with the staff interface. Um, but with the permissions and um, with the structure of the CERC policies and hold policies and all that kind of stuff, um, we segment the patrons from the people who are logging into the system. And so um, because there is that divide, we have some very generic rules set up for users and um, at a very sort of high level that if it doesn't happen to hit anything else in their permissions, um, at least it'll hit that sort of user um, circulation policy. But the, but the staff accounts are outside of that, um, the, or I guess to say patron, um, but the staff accounts are segmented elsewhere. And so um, the, we haven't set up um, circulation to hold policies in a lot of cases that would um, do anything for those staff accounts. Um, or would, would encompass the behavior for those staff accounts. And so um, that's part of the, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the reason too, I think with, with um, um, why we are trying to segment the behavior of log in, do something and circulate checkout books, you know, the ability to interact with the software versus the ability to circulate items and that kind of stuff. I don't know if that makes sense. That was a little bit long-winded, but um, yeah, that's, I think that's part of the reason. Yesterday's two, track two, 3 p.m. session spoke to some of the pros and cons of using staff accounts for circulation. I'm sure a recording will be released soon for further review on Angua. Thanks, Courtney. Well, it looks like we're about 10 minutes from the top of the hour. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us for this session. And um, don't Thanks, forget everybody. that Amy will be hosting all of us tonight in a, uh, um, what is it, what, uh, happy hour? Virtual happy hour, yes. Okay. <laughs>